The Plainville Board of Education Preparing students for success in a changing global society. All right, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Mrs. Tyrell, can you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now we have a special presentation by Dr. Brummett. Thank you very much. I just want to announce that Vice Chair Paul Mary is leading the meeting tonight because Chairwoman uh, Hardy is suffering from laryngitis. But like a trooper, she's here anyway. Um, so I would like to announce our everyday hero for January. Um, our everyday hero is nurse Julie Samard. She is the nurse at Wheeler Elementary School. And she was nominated by Samantha Miller, who is a recess monitor at Wheeler, but also a parent of several children in the school district. And here's what uh, Samantha writes. I have recently started helping Julie in her office. I have been organizing paperwork and doing anything she needs doing. I am truly impressed to see how much she goes through on a daily basis on top of all the paperwork she does. She helps every single student like their, her own children, gives them as much time as they need to recoup, from bumps to scrapes to earaches to something in the eye. The special attention she gives to the kids that need help with daily medical issues. She always has a smile on her face. I look forward to helping and seeing her every day. She truly is Wheeler's Wonder Woman. I can tell you that I loved working with Julie. I can tell you, this is me now talking, that I love working with Julie when I supervise school nurses. She was always calm, willing to assist the nursing team, and extremely knowledgeable about school nursing. And gone are the days when nurses just need to worry about tummy aches and scraped knees. Today, school nurses deal with life-threatening allergies, seizure disorders, students who require complex medical treatment during the school day. Julie does this all, and she does it exceptionally well. And did Andrew want to come up and say a few words, or? Well, just Principal Andrew Batchelder said he might want to say a few words. <laughs> well, on top of all what Julie does every day, she has the uh, complex task of dealing with a principal as a germophobia. Oh, <laughs> didn't know that. So she has to take care of me all day long, every day of the week, and does a great job. Now, Julie's a fantastic nurse. In all seriousness, um, she's the best nurse I've worked with in 22 years as an educator. Um, she's highly effective with parents, kids, teachers, and she goes above and beyond the call of duty every day throughout the night. Um, she's accessible. Um, she does a terrific job, and I'm grateful to have her at Wheeler. Thank you. Congratulations, Julie Smart. Come on up. Didn't know Mr. Batchelder was a germaphobe. <laughs> Come on up, Ms. Julie's daughter, too, and Samantha. And that concludes my special presentation.
Great. Can I get a motion <coughs> to approve um, A? Item A? Yeah. Madam Chairman, I request to approve the minutes of the December 10th, 2018 regular business meeting of the Plano Board of Education. Second. We have a first and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I please get a motion to um, approve item B? Madam Chairman, I request uh, to approve the minutes of the Board of Education special meeting of December 3rd, 2018. Second. I have a first and the second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Can I please get a motion to approve item C? Madam Chairman, I request approval of the minutes of the Board of Education special meeting of December 4, 2018, a meeting with the Facilities Subcommittee. Second. Okay, I have a first and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have a citizen comment, so if anyone would like to come up and comment, just come up to the podium and state your name and address. No one? Okay. Well. All right. Now we have our council liaison, Mrs. Pulisi. Thank you very much. Good evening, Kathy Puglisi, 50 West Broad Street. Happy New Year to all. It's New Year since I've last seen you. I have a few items uh, I thought you might be interested in, some of which you may have been aware of, but I'll just, um, I'll just give you some highlights of our December 17th meeting and our January 7th meeting. At the December 17th meeting, the, um, the council approved a bid for a new fire pumper apparatus. If you recall, back in June, the town approved a referendum for some new equipment for our fire company. We had two, um, two companies to bid for the apparatus. The lowest bidder was submitted by um, Bulldog Fire Apparatus. Um, what's happening right now is the, the the, commit, the subcommittee of the fire company that has been working on the specs and everything that needs to go into this piece of equipment is working with them to make sure that everything that came in in the bid package is included in what the, um, the fire company was looking for. And once the negotiations are completed, the committee will return to a future meeting of the town council, at which point we'll be requested to approve that bid so they can go out and get this apparatus built. They actually do build them from whatever the fire company deems they need to have on this. So it will take, well, probably over a year before we can take um, acceptance of the equipment, but that's the, um, that's actually moving along. The piece of equipment that it's replacing is close to 40 years old, so it's certainly, um, it's certainly in need of being replaced. Also, um, you probably all have heard that our um, planning and economic developer, Mark DeVoe, has accepted another position in Middletown as their city planner. He had worked for the town for 10 years. He is, his knowledge and attention to detail was renowned. He was, um, he was an avid um, supporter of new businesses that came into town, and he certainly helped pave the way for them to come in without as much, much difficulty. He answered questions and made sure that the process was as seamless as possible. We'll certainly miss him. He had uh, a great wealth of knowledge, and he certainly knew Plainville. He grew up in Plainville, and um, Middletown has him now, so we will, we will soldier on, but we certainly wish him the best. Right now, Garrett Daigle, who was the assistant planner, is taking over in that role and an economic development person um, is being sought out. The town manager and staff are um, preparing some things to see what we can do about getting an economic development person on board. Also recently, as you probably are aware, there has been a rash of um, screws and nails being left in our roads. A great many, hundred, actually over 100 people that we know of have had their tires damaged. Somebody is actually dumping screws and nails in our roadways. 
and it creates, um, at this point in time, we are quite lucky that there hasn't been an accident that could have been caused by that type of vandalism. However, it continues to persist. The uh, police department has a plan of investigation right now. They are closely following this, but to date, we have not um, identified anybody that's responsible for this. So the message our chief actually delivered to the council was, if you do have one of these episodes, please let them know. They are building a case. I am confident they will find somebody that's doing this. And all the information that they can gather from anybody that's been affected by this will certainly help if you need to have some type of reparation afterwards. So please, if you do have that, give them a call, let them know where it happened, when it happened, and, and that kind of information would be most helpful to them going forward. Um, this week is Christmas tree disposal in Plainville. The, um, the roadways department will be collecting the live, the live trees, live, formerly live trees, but now they're dead. <laughs> They'll be collecting them between the week of January 14th and 18th. The residents are asked to leave their trees at the curb by January 13th. The trees should be free of ice and snow and should not be left in the road or blocking any sideways or walkways. If you're unable to get your tree out at this time, there is um, a place down at our transfer station where you can bring it yourself and dump the tree into the barrel and our, our folks will be glad to take care of that. But it's certainly, um, this is an annual event that we, um, we provide for the, once we switched over to our, our current recycling program, the town no longer picks up trash, so we have to do it in another manner. And this is how we've decided it's probably the most efficient way to take care of some of those things. So trees are being picked up this week. A um, Couple more items, uh, the, the student winners of the annual fire prevention poster contest were at the town council recently. They were recognized by Larry Sutherland, our fire marshal. It's one of the highlights of our time, certainly having the children come. They bring their posters, we get to see them, their families come, they, they receive an award. So it's another nice um, cooperative effort between our fire company, our fire marshal, and the students in Plainville schools. It's, um, it's always fun to see them and they're very proud to come and show off their, uh, their winning posters. So it was great to have them there. We also appointed a new uh, police officer. His name is Justin Barrington. He will um, become a full-time Plainville police officer effective upon completion of his required training. So he is now at um, police officer training school. When he returns, he will have a specific amount of time with which he'll be working with a current police officer and then um, He'll be on his, on his own, but we're happy to have him aboard. We also had an update recently regarding um, our water quality issues that Plainville has been following over the past probably 18 months or so. Last year, Valley Water, our, water our local privately owned water company, I do stress privately owned, the town does not own the water company. It's owned by a private entity. Um, last year, in response to some complaints regarding water quality, the water company hired Ty and Bond to perform a study to determine the options to soften the water. Um, the engineering study was completed last May and Valley Water conducted a survey to solicit information from customers regarding their concerns related to hard water and asked for input on what the response would, they would like to see from the water company. When the um, original sampling and testing was done, Plainville was determined to have excessively hard water. The way that, and the reason that is, is our water comes from wells in the ground. We do not have a reservoir from which we get the water. Um, and as a result, there's a number of minerals and things that are in the water, making it hard, as they say. Um, according to Valley Water, regarding their survey, 18% of the customers responded to the survey. Now remember, every customer was sent a survey. They stated um, that two thirds of those who responded said that the hard water was either a moderate problem, which they could live with, or not a problem at all. They also went on to state that more than one half of the respondents claimed they were unwilling to pay for any associated water rate increase for softening the water. 
The Valley Water Board of Directors had determined rather than constructing a costly treatment plant, they will pursue an alternate course of action through operational changes, such as blending with their other water sources to reduce hardness, as well as provide assistance and advice on how to deal with the effect for individual customers. The town staff is going to be meeting with representatives of Valley Water, the State Department of Health, and Pura, which is a regulatory agency of the state of Connecticut. Pura regulates the rates that Valley Water can charge to their customers in an attempt to get a better understanding of what they have proposed. Notices have been sent out to customers regarding the survey as well as their plans for moving forward. Plainville has um, basically two wells, one on Woodford Avenue and one over by Northwest Drive. The Woodford Avenue well is harder water than the water in the other well. So what they're going to attempt to do is blend it by trying to mix the water together, hoping it will lessen the effects of the hardness. I'm sure that's, that's something that's going to go on for some time before they get some kind of results and testing back to see if what their efforts are have made any difference. So that is a, a project that had been um, very much publicized in the town. The town council held a public information session a year and a half ago. We had a few hundred people there. I will say that all of the residents that spoke that evening were not in favor of Plainville water. Some people go to the extent of putting softeners and filters on their home themselves in order to make things um, a little bit better. Others just believe the water company is responsible for making sure the water that comes into their home is of a certain quality. So this is an ongoing um, issue. The town will be coordinating with the water company and with its residents. If anybody has any questions, you certainly can call the town manager's office. Probably the most direct information you'll get would be from Valley Water itself. So I would encourage anybody to do that if you're, if you're interested. If there are any other um, public meetings that we have as a follow-up, we'll certainly make sure everybody gets an opportunity to come and speak. Um, tomorrow, we're going to be meeting with the board for our joint buz budget preview. Um, we're looking forward to that. As I had uh, recently found out, the governor has requested a delay in presenting the state's budget. Usually, his budget needs to be delivered by the early part of February, probably first or second week. He's requested that he has a delay to present his budget, and now it will be more close to the end of the month. So our anxious anticipation is put off for a little while, but it, it's really going to be, um, it's going to be another interesting time. They're going to be developing the biennium budget. We all know about the um, deficits that exist and some of the proposals out there for trying to, to do some other things in the state. So um, we'll begin our work sessions on the budget in March. I believe the board starts them this month. Next week. OK. So, so the, this is upon us. And uh, it, it would be nice if we had more information earlier on to plan more appropriately, but we do not. So we will continue on and keep our eye and keep our ears open with our, with our legislative representatives who can bring back information as it, um, as it starts to develop. And just one last thing as a public service announcement, the Plainville Food Pantry is having its major fundraiser on Saturday, January 26th at the AquaTurf beginning at 6 p.m. If anybody's interested in attending, please call Susie Wurst at the Food Pantry for tickets. That's it. Does I'd be anyone? happy to answer any questions if anybody has any for me. <clears throat> okay. Right. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Next, we have the superintendent's report. Thank you very much. Uh, the first item on my report this evening is going to be an update on the state of Plainville High School. I have uh, Mr. Carl Johnson, our brand new high school principal here to go over some of our highlights from all the departments. And he's also joined by his administrative team, Chris Farrell, John Coe, and maybe later on we'll announce the third person from his assistant principal team. Um, Mr. Johnson, it's all yours. You. Uh, as you mentioned, brand new. So this uh, presentation will only cover anything after November 1st. Um, no, just, just <laughs> all right. Um, so 
first off, thank you, Dr. Bromit, uh, Mr. O'Page, Plainville Community School of the Board of Education. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight um, on behalf of Plainville High School. Um, you know, traditionally, I believe this is an update of the high school and really to get a chance to tell the board all the great things that are occurring at Plainville High. Um, if I am long-winded, um, I apologize because of my love for Plainville High School. Um, if you talk to me for a period of time, I think you'll realize that that's true. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot I want to highlight, but I will try to keep it brief. Um, so, uh, Plainville High School, just quickly by the numbers, currently we are at 696 students, um, pretty evenly um, dispersed throughout the four grades that are currently here. Um, we have maintained pretty stable in terms of enrollment. Um, I know there had originally been some predictions of a drop in enrollment at the high school, but um, we've actually maintained right around that 700 number. Um, if you go on to faculty and staffing, um, what you can see is we have 11 academic departments. Uh, currently we have 59 academic staff, um, as you would call them. Uh, you can see the pairs and tutors, school counselors, uh, four administrators, uh, one SRO, which I'll highlight in a minute, uh, six office professionals, and then also two security monitors. Uh, 96 total staff at the high school. Uh, some of those people are, um, do have responsibilities at other schools or elsewhere in the town, but you know, we consider them part of us, so we're counting them as whole. Um, in terms of security enhancements, which I just think is an important thing to mention this year, as we have uh, done quite a bit with that. Um, over the summer, 23 cameras were added to the high school. Um, it brings our total to 50 uh, cameras, both exterior and interior in the high school. Um, we also have gone through an enhanced lockdown and emergency training. Um, a majority of that occurred in the November PD day, um, and we'll continue training. And I, you know, I, for me personally, you know, we take the safety and security of our students here at PHS very seriously. Um, and so, you know, priority number one is that, um, and we will continue training on that and continue, you know, as we can. Uh, if you've been to the high school recently or any school throughout the Plainville Community Schools, uh, you probably noticed that we have an updated vi uh, visitor management system. Um, so you've seen the Raptor system in place. Uh, we rolled that out at the high school without, I think, any issues. Um, and really for me, um, the best part of it is, you know, we have a very large high school here, uh, building-wise. And we have people coming in the building. Um, and it allows us to have a very accurate idea of who's in the building at any one time. Um, so that's been a huge addition. Uh, the largest addition that I just wanted to really highlight um, was SRO Martins coming on um, to our staff this year. Um, I, I can't thank the board enough um, and also the town council for their support of this position. Um, I think when you think about a position being added to a school or any organization, um, if you can't imagine life without it, um, that tells you how successful it's been. Um, so in the four months that SRO Martins has been here, um, she's become an invaluable part of our staff. Um, obviously doing, you know, what everyone would assume, which is her work as a police officer, um, but so much more. Um, and I tried to put some photos up there really highlighting what SRO Martins does on a daily basis. Um, she is teaching classes consistently. Um, she is forming relationships with students. Um, which, you know, for me is maybe most important. Um, there are a number of students who gravitate towards her. Um, and then you also have the fact that she comes with a wealth of expertise. And I really like that photo of her walking after the uh, crime scene investigation where they did a, a mock accident in the bus lane. Um, and so she's able to bring that expertise to our students. Um, in terms of school improvement goals this year, um, very consistent with last year. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll talk about the direction we're heading in. Um, you know, I, I'm not gonna read through each of them because they are similar to last year's school improvement goals. There are some variation though. Um, one of the important things for us is that all students leaving Plainville High School have a post-secondary plan. Um, I'll highlight in a few minutes the school counseling department, the work they've done on that um, and continue to do on that to make sure every student has a post-secondary plan. Uh, last year, Mr. Medic met with every senior before they left Plainville High School um, to talk to them about their post-secondary plan. I plan to continue that this year. Um, I think that's a really important uh, kind of last rite of passage before seniors take off. Um, we also, too, if you've, you know, 
uh, we've been working on learning targets um, at the high school, seeing as a valuable piece of instruction. Um, we now feel confident that learning targets have been adopted throughout the building, uh, throughout all disciplines. Um, and really what that is is just writing learning goals for students in student-friendly language. Um, so students are clear on what is happening on a daily basis. Um, the two that are a little bit different is that we really are focusing too on instructional strategies to try to improve uh, student learning. Um, so this year, kind of a math focused goal um, was looking at improving students problem solving and data analysis skills that is pulled directly from the PSAT and SAT. Um, and then in terms of an English goal, we are looking at improving students reading comprehension and text analysis skills and again pulled from the PSAT and SAT. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, the last one is also reducing chronic absenteeism. Um, this is one of the benchmarks that the state uses um, when they analyze us each year. Um, and we have been working hard to reduce that number. The goal we set for ourselves is to get to 10% or below. Um, just so you know, in the 16-17 in the school year, we were at 15.5%. In 17-18, um, we dropped to 10.7%, um, and this year we are hoping to drop below that 10%. 10.7%, um, just so you know, is puts us right basically with the state average, um, but we want to drop below that. Um, chronic absenteeism, just so you know too, is it's, it's a student who misses more than 10% of the school year. So it would be 18 days, um, and that's the benchmark that the state makes for chronic absenteeism, but that includes everything. Um, in terms of student instruction, um, as I mentioned, uh, our use of learning targets has become widespread. If you've had a chance to come on district rounds at the high school, um, it's one of the things that we constantly check. Um, and we do feel like it's having a, you know, uh, definitely an improvement on student learning. Um, you can also, too, I think one of the most important things we've probably done is look at universal instructional interventions um, that we've adopted across da um, all departments. Um, so a lot of these have to do with those two goals that deal with either reading comprehension or data analysis. Um, we try to come up with good strategies that we can then use in any department, any discipline, any classroom, and we've really worked at that. Um, we've also looked at student engagement. Um, I give the teachers at PHS an incredible amount of credit for thinking outside the box, um, trying to come up with new um, lesson plans, new activities, new assessments that are trying to drive student engagement and you know increase student learning at the high school. I also too just wanted to highlight the use of common planning time. Um, this is the second year now we've had common planning time at the high school, um, which allows us to work collaboratively, um, teachers within their departments, and it's been a huge asset to the high school. On the next two slides, uh, I just had some PSAT result data. Um, we like to look at it by cohort. Um, so we like to track it over time, looking at a specific group of kids. Um, looking at it year to year um, is valuable, but we really like to look at what's happening with a group of students as they move their way through the high school. Um, so you can see we have the class of 2019 in orange. Um, you can see in the fall of 2016, when they took the PSAT, um, they had a combined average score of 927. And currently, when they took the SATs this fall, for the students who did, um, they've risen to a 1078. Um, as you look through the data, I mean, you know, it's, I'm not going to belabor reading every data point, but I think the important thing for us is that when you look year to year within a cohort, they're all rising. Um, and so the instructional strategies that we feel we're putting in place, the work that we're doing, it's having a direct impact on student learning. Um, on the next slide, you have the class of 2021 and also the class of 2022. Um, we're very excited for the class of 2023 to join us. That'll be the first group who has taken the PSATs in eighth grade. Um, so we'll have another data point to kind of look at and see how um, our instructional strategies are impacting them as they come to the high school. Um, and again, uh, for the class of 2021, we're seeing the same thing occurring, which is a rise year to year within the cohort, which is what we hope for. Um, on the following slide, just kind of a summary of that student learning and performance that goes, you know, maybe a little bit beside, beyond PSAT. Um, you know, as I said, they continue to show growth over time. Um, one of the things that we've really adopted throughout the high school is the use of SAT-like questions on assessments um, so that students get exposure to SAT-type questions uh, when they're doing assessments in classes. Um, what I think you might find interesting is that this is not um, solely being done in math classes or English classes, but it's being done across all disciplines. 
Um, so you can go into a physical education class and you can see students using SAT-like questions when it's appropriate. Um, and it's really hoping to you know, bring that exposure to the type of questions that they'll ask. And at the end of the day, it's just strong skills that they need. Um, and so that's why we value it so much. Uh, we've also put interventions in place to try to assist students, um, SAT prep classes. This year we also, with the uh, work of the math department and really you know, them doing it on their own, uh, creating a math lab, um, which we're then, we'll talk about at the end, but we're gonna try to replicate and move forward. Um, and also the use of Khan Academy. I did wanna highlight uh, the SAT prep classes. We've now had SAT prep classes back at PHS for a year and a half. Um, if you look at those individual students, um, you can see the impact that these SAT prep classes are having um, on them. So out of 94 students, the average growth for the English uh, writing reading test is a 55 point increase and a 60 point increase for math. So that is before they took the class till after they took the class when they retake the test. Um, so it's having a huge impact on them um, and we, we really see the benefit. Um, you know, one of the big things too is you know, and this is very important for us, is using the testing data as a way to analyze student performance and really understand what skills we need to um, address. When I talk about the math department in a few minutes, um, you're gonna see the power of that and how much trying to target a specific skill and really looking at um, how we can benefit those students, it can be incredibly powerful. Um, and I think, you know, just importantly is that if you come to the high school, if you come to a CPT meeting, if you come to a PLC meeting, you know, we're continually trying to refine and examine how we can assist students. Um, and this is one way we try to do it. So on the next slide, we just talked about common planning time. Like I said, this is the second year of CPT time at the high school. Um, what that means is that every teacher in the high school, uh, in a four day rotation, they have one period that is set aside to meet with their department um, and they can work together collaboratively. Uh, it's very important for me, we, you know, we expect our students to work collaboratively, um, and it's important for me that students see our teachers working collaboratively. Um, it's incredibly valuable uh, to the growth of the departments and to the growth of teachers. Um, they use the time for a host of activities. If you ever get a chance to come to a CPT meeting, a meeting it's one of the most professionally rewarding experiences I think you could see. Um, they're working on curriculum, they're working on planning instruction, they're working on development of best practices. Um, analysis of student data and designing student assessments, just to name some of what they do. Um, and these CPTs have really been, um, you know, I think instrumental in driving a lot of instructional growth and student learning growth um, at Plainville High School. Um, in terms of school climate, uh, student discipline numbers, um, you know, so we looked again at September, October, November, December. Um, and as you can see, our numbers have fallen um, in terms of student discipline that's being, um, you know, merited. Um, what, I, what I think is important to understand and when we reflect on this, I think is the work that's being done. And I really want to credit our school support staff, um, you know, obviously the fellow administrators and also our teachers. Um, you know, when we get to the point of student discipline, um, I view it very much as a reactive thing. Um, and so we've been putting a lot of work into the proactive. Um, and so trying to ensure that before we get to the point where we're issuing student discipline, and obviously there's cases where you have to, um, but also working to try to ensure that we don't get to that point. Um, and I think the numbers show that, that you know, we're having some success with that. I just wanna, I forgot to mention, but all the photos in the backgrounds are from this year um, and just highlighting kind of life at Plainville High School over four months. So just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Um, just some quick department highlights. Um, some of the departments really wanted me to highlight some of the work that they're doing. Um, in Unified Arts, um, you know, we've, the Unified Arts Department does some incredible stuff. Um, you know, some incredible work with students. Um, you know, the Go Baby Go program is well known um, and a real highlight of the work that they do. Um, the, the shop classes have started to look at mass production. Um, techniques, uh, you know, I was, I was actually down there doing an observation and they had created a true shop in the wood shop. They had a foreman who was running everything and they were meriting out jobs and, you know, reassigning tasks as they fell behind on things. So uh, really doing some great stuff. Also just highlighting um, recently in the wood shop, we've added a new flatbed CNC. Um, it's really a point of pride for Plainville High School. Um, this machine, as far as the representative has told us, we're pretty sure we're the only um, high school in the Northeast that has one of these. 
Um, and so the students at Plainville High are really getting some unique experiences. Um, and not only doing traditional wood shop, auto shop type things, but also taking it to engineering and CNC milling and all that you know, great stuff. Um, and we continue to plan to grow that program. Uh, in science, um, you know, I think with the NGSS standards, um, what you've seen is a real move towards bringing science to the students. Um, if you go into a science classroom, uh, they're trying to look at basically how science impacts them and the world around them. Um, you'll see students going out, uh, a couple photos there of them collecting samples um, to bring back. Um, just some really interesting projects. A lot of self-direction. Um, if you go into labs today, um, it's not you know, kind of how you probably reimagine uh, high school labs happening, but it's a lot of self-direction, coming up with your own process for things. Um, you know, so some very interesting stuff. I also just wanted to highlight um, the EC physics class this year. They actually did a, a crime scene reconstruction, so an accident reconstruction. Uh, with collaboration with the Plainville Police Department, they actually had a uh, Plainville police car come down the, uh, the bus lane at a good rate of speed um, <laughs> and hit the brakes um, <laughs> and basically produce some skid marks. And then the students used their physics knowledge to recreate and basically figure out speed. And you know, it was some pretty interesting stuff. And again, SRO Martins was heavily involved in that. Um, Actually, our NIASC visit was happening right at that time, so we warned the NIASC team that if you hear some skidding, not to be uh, <laughs> too concerned. Um, the library media department, um, you know, I, I just, you know, if you come to the high school, you're going to see that the media center really is a central hub for the high school. Um, so uh, Mrs. Peichel, our library media specialist, uh, this year alone, all right, so we're talking about four months, we've already had 16,585 visits to the library media center. Um, she also wanted to record, we've had 1,370 books checked out. Um, one of the very, you know, I think interesting, cool, however you want to put it, things that have been added is the collab. Um, so basically a, collab, a collaboration laboratory um, that's been added uh, in the upper media center. Um, inside this room you can find monitors that students can hook their Chromebooks up to. The desks are whiteboards, so they can write on the desks. Um, it's basically a space that's designed to work collaboratively in groups. Um, and also in that room, we've also added another green screen in the building, and students have begun using that for video projects. I know AP US History just did one um, and had some pretty good results. Um, in the social studies department, in, you know, with the school improvement goals, um, they really looked at reading comprehension. Um, and what they've done is really looked at um, using primary source reading as a way to hit that reading comprehension and text analysis. And so what they've identified are some key strategies that they're using across all classrooms um, to ensure that students are you know, building their capacity for reading comprehension. In the math department, um, you know, the math department has led the way on a lot of SAT and PSAT interventions. Um, one of the things that happened this year was um, math teachers uh, voluntarily were willing to have students come in during their study hall periods um, to work on math. Um, we've, had over we've had 217 students in semester one take advantage of that um, who have voluntarily come to receive extra help in math with teachers. Um, the SAT station is a voluntary uh, program up in the math wing. If you're ever walking up there, you'll see it. Uh, where they put out SAT problems for students to take, completely self-directed. Um, you know, basically, if they want to take one, they can take one. Um, and we've had 203 practice sessions taken by students um, who have chosen to do that on their own. I think maybe one of the most important things, and this really just highlights a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, last year, when we looked at school improvement goals and we looked at PSAT data, what we realized is that a strand inside the PSAT that we refer to as heart of algebra um, was where students were having some real trouble. Um, the math department identified some targeted interventions. Um, those interventions were used universally throughout the math department. So not only if you were taking algebra, but if you were also taking geometry, pre-calc, whatever class you were in, the, that heart of algebra stuff came back. Um, and we really wanted to target that skill. It also spread into some of the other disciplines in the building, like I said, really looking at universal interventions, so trying to bring it to other courses, trying to bring it to other places so that students are encountering this. Um, the results, you know, I think really show the power of this, which is 
when we get PSAT data back, what they do is they break students down into basically three groupings. And the, the easy way to put it is kind of like a low, gr low skill grouping, an average skill grouping, and then a high skill grouping. So prior to the intervention taking place, and we really focused on the um, class of 2020 as a cohort, um, when you look at it, what you see is that prior to the intervention, we had 44% of students in the low skill area. Obviously, this is one of the reasons why we identified this as a key area where we needed growth. 45% in the average skill area and then 11% in the high. After the intervention, so now when we went back and we looked at this year's PSAT data, um, what we see is that that number for the low skill average has dropped in half. Um, we cut that down incredibly. Um, people in the average skill area has grown and then also people in the high skill area has grown. Um, importantly for us, and I think you know this isn't earth shattering or anything like that, but when you take student data and you really analyze it and you target specific skills, you can have some real success. Um, and that's what we're seeing and that's what we're trying to replicate over and over again as we try to grow student learning. In the English department, um, this year there was a major change in the way seniors take English, um, which I'm, I'm sure maybe you remember as the approval of courses last year. So English 12 electives, um, students were allowed to choose um, semester long English electives. Uh, we'll be continuing that this year. In terms of the close reading and text analysis strategies, the English department has um, focused in on a strategy called Notice and Note, uh, which is a close reading strategy. It, basically, you look for six signposts while you're reading. And then, you know, if you see one of those signposts, you try to take notes, you try to focus on that stuff so you really understand what you're reading. And that strategy is being disseminated throughout the building. Um, the English department is also working on developing SAT resources like the math department that can be put out to any discipline. Um, so again, if you're in an art class, if you're in a math class, if you're in a, you know, whatever class, you can still use an English, you know, SAT-like question um, and teachers have access to that. Um, and then you also, too, uh, the English department is excited, and I think this is a direction they're moving in, which is the implementation of choice books and also free writing, um, you know, really trying to increase student engagement um, with English. Um, and so, you know, moving away from, at times, the entire class reading one book um, and starting to look at the idea of choice when it comes to student reading and offering up different books that students can choose from. The school counseling department, um, you know, the school counseling department plays a huge role in ensuring our post-secondary plan for all our students. Um, you know, you have the, one of the major highlights I think that, and it's, it's coming up again this year, is the implementation of online course requests. Uh, that was the first year, last year was the first time we did this through PowerSchool. Um, students are able to go on at home um, and request courses. Uh, we'll be doing that again this year. Um, one of the major benefits for us is gaining back a day of instruction. Uh, previously, we used to have to take what we called an X day right after midterms, and we basically shut down the high school, um, and students would go around getting requests from teachers. Um, what we're now able to do is, because of using the online platform, um, is able to do that you know, uh, online and gain back a day. Importantly, too, really what it's designed to do is create a conversation between parents and students. Um, and so that's what we really try to stress and we try to over communicate when this portal opens. Um, we really want parents and students and guardians having a conversation about the courses that their students are choosing to take. Um, you know, and really thinking about that. And so that's a major thing. The school counseling department last year, they committed themselves to one-on-one -on -one meetings with every student at least three times. Um, and they've been successful with that. Part of that is also cleaning up um, scheduling and the way requests are done to create time for that to happen. Um, you know, I just wanted to take a second too because we, we don't really get a chance to do this with the um, state of PHS because usually we focus on the first couple of months, but I did want to celebrate the class of 2018 and especially with school counseling. 78% um, of students from the class of 2018 went on to higher education. 4% um, of students went on to a vocational or a trade school. Uh, about 1% of students went on to the military. Uh, that would be directly into the military, so not to our ROTC program. 13% um, of students joined the workforce, um, so had plans to basically go directly into the workforce. Um, one of the other things I think, you know, really I would highlight for the school counseling department is that 72% of seniors were accepted to their first choice college or trade school, um, you know, which they're very proud of. I'm very proud of it. I think our entire school is very proud of that the class of 2018 through learning through service, 
um, completed 5,330 hours of community service um, across the class. Um, and then also, you know, I, I know Dr. Bradman mentions this at graduation, but through the ECE program, we had um, the class of 2018 earned 1,004 college credits. Um, you know, that can be transferred. And then 56% of the class of 2018 took at least one college level course while they were at PHS. Um, so I really wanted to highlight that and kind of show the work that our school counseling department does and the entire school for that matter. Um, in regards to the fine arts department, um, you know, I, <laughs> I think everyone knows the incredible job that our fine arts department does at PHS. If you're lucky enough to come to one of our concerts or one of our shows, I think you, you realize that very quickly. Um, currently, right now, we have 72 members of the various choirs um, at PHS. Um, so that includes concert choir, women's choir, and also chamber choir. We also have a seven, 116 members of the bands. Um, so that includes concert band and jazz band. Um, we also have um, a wide variety of art courses that are offered for students throughout the building. Um, so if you're lucky enough, you can come in and you can see a jewelry course, a ceramics course, a studio art class, um, some really interesting offerings for students that you know not every school is able to do. Um, I did want to highlight to athletics. Um, so in the fall, this fall, we had 284 registered student athletes. That's a 41% participation rate um, at Plainville High School. Um, you know, that's a, we're very proud of that, the number of students we have participating in athletics. Um, this winter, and I think this is you know, very important too, is that this, this winter we have 212 registered student athletes. That's an increase from 157 last year. And a huge part of that is indoor track. Um, and the number of student athletes we've been able to bring on board um, due to indoor track, and I, you know, I, I, you know, it's it's just an important thing. And I think you know, there's so much data out there about when students are participating in extracurricular activities, and the impact that has on student learning. Um, Coach Farrell, you know, really wanted me to emphasize too the pride we take in our athletic programs that they also see themselves as part of the community. Um, so you know, there's a whole litany of activities up there um, that our athletic programs take part in raising funds and also contributing community service hours to the community, um, you know, really investing themselves in our town. Um, we also had over 70 student athletes this fall who received all academic from the CCC conference. Um, obviously as principal, I, I take great pride in that because you know, it is student athlete. Um, we do put that first and we expect our athletes to maintain um, high levels of academic success. Uh, Coach Farrell, I, you know, and along with his coaching staff, um, I give them a lot of credit. I think this is some um, really kind of cutting edge stuff for athletic departments. Um, they've developed a set of core values for the athletic department. The idea being is to bring some coherence from sport to sport um, so that if you play multiple sports or even if you just only play one sport, that we have a set of values that we have as Plainville athletes. Um, and that's what we hold ourselves to. Um, and so you can see accountability, competitiveness, respectfulness, loyalty, motivation, you know, being appreciative. Those are the core values that the coaches have come up with and you know, we're working with our players. Just to um, finish up, I wanted to mention the NEASC process um, just because we did finish the first stage of that for our 10-year accreditation. So this uh, fall, October 18th and 19th, um, we completed our collaborative conference. Um, three, three representatives from NEAS came to our school. They spent two days with us. Um, I think if you ask anyone, it was an incredibly positive affirmation of the work that we do here. Um, you know, we got a very strong feedback from the visiting group that they felt like we're doing some very special things here, and I, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with them. Um, one of the things that you know, we took a lot of pride in, and I really credit the NEASC team, um, especially Mrs. Pico and Mrs. Guadarrama, who chaired the NEASC uh, visiting group. Um, they complimented us on our process and actually took some of our materials back uh, to NEASC because they want to use them for other schools who are beginning this process. Um, the follow-up visit will occur in November of 2020. A larger group will come out. What they do is they would like to check in on the work we have done in those two years. Um, so the work we are going to do, and I think this is important just because you know, as I stand up here next year, um, this is what we'll be talking about is this work that we're completing um, is the priority growth areas. Um, so in terms of priority growth areas, uh, one of the first ones, and just so you understand, these are self-identified. Um, these are areas that as a school we felt like is the direction we need to head in. 
Um, these are not things that NIESC is telling us to do. These are things that we identified for ourselves and we feel like are the next points where we need to head as a high school. So firstly uh, will be the development of a vision of the graduate. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then also refine and expand tier two interventions. Um, so really looking at how we provide interventions for students um, at this high school, um, especially targeted interventions. Um, so kind of some of the things I've referenced. Um, and then also lastly, and you know, I just take this as a point of pride is they really had a hard time um, and the NIES committee was very forthright with us that they're having a hard time coming up with a, a third recommendation, uh, a third priority growth area, because they really did feel like we were doing some very strong things. Um, and what we discussed collaboratively was increasing student ownership of their education and also voice in their education. Um, and that's where we're gonna be doing some work as well. Um, so on the next slide, uh, the vision of the graduate work, we've already actually begun this. Um, there's been some professional learning that has taken place. Uh, we've already come up with a draft of the skills we believe we are going to head in the direction of in terms of a vision of the graduate. Um, you can see we're trying to build off of what we've already done at Plainville High School and Plainville Community Schools, which is prepare, inspire, engage, um, and really looking at what kind of skills come off of that. Um, currently, we're on a road show um, where we're going around to all the other schools, um, showing them kind of what we're working on. And then the next step, we'll be forming a larger committee um, to really start to define these skills um, once we feel like we've locked in on them. Um, in terms of tier two interventions, um, we really want to continue to look at how we provide interventions to students at our high school. Uh, we're going to be looking at math and English labs um, to, again, provide those targeted interventions. Um, there's going to be a lot of work that's going to be done with that in the coming year. Um, we're also looking at social emotional interventions. Um, so looking at the whole student, um, it would be very easy just to focus on the academic, um, but we really want to look at you know, the total student at Plainville High. Um, we're actually excited, uh, Mrs. Jarrell, our school social worker, uh, just recently has formed a partnership with Connecticut Children's Medical Center, and we're gonna be uh, working on a group looking at healthy relationships. Um, and that's already one of those interventions we're gonna be putting in place. Uh, and then lastly, student ownership and voice. Um, you know, I, I think this is probably gonna be some of the most interesting stuff and some of the most uh, exciting things for us. Uh, one of the things that we're really looking at is reimagining the school day. Um, so what that means, uh, especially for seniors, um, you know, and really thinking about what that's gonna look like as seniors move forward in their education and increasing responsibility, increasing their ownership of their education um, and the directions they wanna head in. And then also to, um, you know, looking at student-led groups, student input into our high school. Uh, I'll just highlight one very quickly. The tech club under Mr. Ricardo um, is, you know, basically going to be managing the auditorium um, and really taking a student-led approach to that. Um, and so when that's feasible and when we can do that, we really want to empower students more so. Um, so I believe that is it. I just ended with a nice photo of graduation last year. So uh, there we go. If you weren't at graduation, it was just incredible because a rainbow popped out right as we were basically graduating. So, yeah. so thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? I do. Yeah? Um, as far as the absentee goes, it's 18 days. Does that take into account any children that have surgery or like a severe illness? It does. Um, the state does not, <laughs> the state sends a benchmark. Um, and so if it is, you know, the state establishes a line. Um, we have to abide by that line in terms of the accountability index. Um, the state doesn't take account for medical absences, you know, anything like that. Um, so basically, if you're absent, you're absent, um, is how the state views it. So it absolutely makes it a challenge because um, you do have students who have significant uh, medical illnesses, you know, a whole host of things that can come up throughout the school year. Um, and so really trying to you know, educate students, educate parents, you know, that, that's a big part of it, you know, but obviously there are, there is a host of unforeseen circumstances that make it incredibly challenging. Can they make up for those days if they're out for more than 18? Well, for us, they can. Um, not for the, the state. No, the state is very rigid about if you're out, you're out. Um, you know, the state views it very cut and dry when we report it back out. Um, you know, obviously we, we have our own in, internal tracking 
um, that we do have student absenteeism. Um, you know, and we understand very much why students are absent. Um, but you know, for the state, it really is just it comes down to a number. You know. And one more question: yeah. If they're out for a significant period of time, do we send them? Are we required to send them a home school teacher? Well, it, yeah. So it depends on the circumstance. Um, what would happen is that if a you know if a student has a significant medical illness, um, then obviously we we look at how to best support that student. You know, which could include you know homebound tutoring if need. And does that count as being absent if you send? Yep. Oh yes. Okay. So it's schools. in the building. You have to <laughs> yep. be in the building. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, okay. you know, it's 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 a real challenge, and I you know, I understand the position the state is in um, because it's you know, uh, you know. The number of variations you can get with attendance, I know it sounds like a very simple you know, thing, it's like absent or not, but it's, it's an incredibly complex um, situation, I guess would be the best way to put it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I just had a quick question, yeah. uh, Principal Johnson. Could you explain the responsibility of the school monitors? Yeah, so the school monitors in the building, um, you know, they do, they do a whole host of activities throughout the day. Um, you know, whether it be, monitoring the hallways, um, monitoring um, arrival, dismissal. Um, you know, they also fill in a lot of times for other staff members, so, you know, covering the front desk if that's needed. Um, they also assist us incredibly with, um, you know, retrieving students, helping us out finding students. You know, there, there's a whole myriad of activities that we do with this, the school Myers. Um, you know, we have two, um, in my experience, uh, we have two very strong school monitors in our building. Um, they really are invaluable to us. Um, I feel like I'm shortchanging them because I'm, you know, answering quickly. But uh, the work they do and um, the expertise, I'll, you know, I'll just I'll highlight real quickly. Um, you know, I call him Chief Wool Humphrey, but um, if you know uh, Mr. Humphrey, uh, he was the former chief of police for Canton. Um, he's our head of security at the high school. Um, we're incredibly lucky to have him. Um, just to give you an idea, you know, he, he he does a phenomenal job here, along with Mr. Delena, um, and I think too, you know, one of the things I would mention, just like SRO Martins, is the relationship they build with students. Um, it's another point of contact. It's another person that you know kids feel connected to, um, which is hugely important. Thank you, and I just want to make a comment. I just want to express my happiness to see how Plainville District just improves moves forward every year, it just, just instills confidence with us as well as the community. So keep up the good work and thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. Oh, sorry. Um, I think you mentioned that, that the NEASC visit in 2018, they didn't actually give you the report yet. Is that correct? We haven't received it yet. Um, we're still waiting on the finalized draft. Um, I will say this, we're, it, it, there's going to be, I would I would expect no surprises no because the way the way we do it now with the collaborative visit um, is that we basically work in you know truly what it sounds like we work in collaboration with each other um, and so even to the extent of you know talking back and forth about the direction we want our high school to go in um, they don't you know I, I've been on a visit myself um, so I can speak to this you know we don't view it anymore and Nias doesn't view it as coming in to try to catch something or to try to do an investigation. It really is just looking at, okay, have they laid out a plan for what they want to do in the future? How are, you know, have they, do they seem like they have a way they're going to get there? And then coming back just to see what progress has been made. Um, you know, it's, for us, it, I think it's very powerful because it's not, you know, it's not someone else telling us you need to do this. It's, it's us saying we want to do this and them affirming that, basically saying, you know, we think this is the right direction. So, so seeing the three goals that you determined and I think you did even say it that it was kind of a, even in conversation with them at the same time kind of collaborative yeah absolutely looking at what yep. are, what's you know what would be your third goal so yeah. um, I just wanted to clarify that but yep. that's, absolutely that's great uh, it's a great process I think uh, it's something that has improved over the years for sure <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you were involved in an old NES visit they could be uh, pretty laborious so yeah it's definitely it's definitely changed Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank you. much. Just want to thank uh, Mr. Johnson. It's hard to believe he's only been principal for two months. 
<laughs> and he's had a very seamless transition um, in many ways and has carried the ball forward uh, quite, quite beautifully. And I'm, I know I'm not alone in my sentiments on that one. Um, so thank you, Mr. Johnson. We have one more um, component of the high school that we'd like to discuss this evening. We have Judy Hahn here. She's the head of our world language department. And she, in co cooperation with Rosa Perez, who, as everyone knows, has a world language background, have forged a recommendation for a new AP course that she's going to describe this evening. And, and I'm very excited about it because it is, in many ways, an outgrowth of the fact that we're teaching world language starting in eighth grade. Now we're, we're needing to offer more rigorous courses at the high school. But I will let Ms. Han describe where we're headed with that. So Pretty Ms. Han. Sweet. Pretty sure you just covered all that I was going to say. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Whoops. Um, yes. So the, we, we are proposing to add the uh, advanced placement French language and culture as an option for um, our seniors for our fifth year, because of the option now in the middle school to get year one credit. Um, they could theoretically finish their world language studies when they're juniors, and we don't want that to happen. We want them to continue on and, and grow more. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to read this, but typically our students score a two on when they take an AP world language. Um, and we feel as a result of an additional year, the extra year of study, we will therefore be increasing their potential to score a three or better on the exam. Um, I don't think that there are any disadvantages per se to, uh, to doing this. There are only advantages. Once again, they can earn the college credit with the AP scores. Um, reduce their college costs, which is important, um, and show that they actually have the ability to take a college-level course. Um, we, I don't know, what else do you need to know? <laughs> 10 to 20 students, it's not, not asking for a whole lot. We plan to roll this out next year. We've already got the syllabus in process. It's being created now, this year. Um, roll it out next year, and then reevaluate how our students are doing when they've taken the test in May of uh, 2020 for the first time. And then hopefully we can report out next year in the state of PHS on how many great scores they got for us. That's the plan. So the proposal's in the board packet. And um, on the last page of the proposal, um, Ms. Han outlines the three-year total cost, which is about $7,000, which is pretty minimal for a brand new course. And that's broken out over three years, um, I believe. Um, I think it's a pretty cost-effective course to run, and I'm excited about how many children might take it and then enhance their AP scores. So does the board have any questions about AP Just, uh, French? Yes, please. Um, will it be, the AP course will be one college credit. Is that what it will be equivalent to if they pass? Well, it depends on the score that they earn on the exam and okay. the college that they're attending. Okay. Certain different colleges, you know, want a three. I've heard, I don't know this for a fact, this is what a student said, that some want higher scores, That's true. AP scores. So it's not exactly the same as the way the ECE works, where if you earn a C, you get the three credits okay. already. Um, but they, based on their score on the AP exam, could mm -hmm. earn them credits. And what would this um, course entail? Um, it's a lot of speaking, and they, he, it involves, hang on, I have that. Um, so, um, interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational modes of communication in real life situations. So he tries to make it meaningful, will try to make it meaningful for them, you know, things that they're interested in, current events, they have, would have debates. Um, it's not just simply reading and writing, they would be speaking and using the language. That's excellent. Hopefully. Sounds like a Dale Carnegie. <laughs> in French. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come on up. So just so you know, one of the things the board always looks at is is the extra staff. How much does it cost? You know, when we look at these proposals, right to the bottom line. <laughs> but no, it was it was you know a great proposal. So also to add to uh, to your question, Michael, um, language courses at the AP level have two courses, just like in English. You have the English language, AP language, French, and Spanish, but you also have the literature component. Um, based on starting language development in, in ninth grade, 
we would not have time to offer the literature course because it's a brand new language. So imagine reading um, college level text um, in high school in a different language. But this gives us the opportunity to offer up to the language course, which is a true language development college course. So speaking, reading, writing. So it's the communication piece of, of the language. Um, it's not going to affect any FTEs, full-time employees. The current um, staff that we have will be able to cover the material, I mean, the courses that we currently have. Uh, the teacher, um, which is Sam Ragaluth, has already attended the AP week-long course last summer. He's in the process of developing the curriculum right now, and it will be submitted to me and to AP by June. So then we just have to acquire the materials, the textbooks that are uh, not required but suggested by College Board to have for the course. And that's the last piece in, in order to implement the course. Thank you. It sounds exciting. Oh, it is. Yeah. Thank you. I used to be an AP language teacher, oh. so, <laughs> so it's awesome. One, one other very quick question. And this is a class where only French will be spoken in the classroom by both the students and the teachers. Yes, that if, if you actually right now yeah. um, at the level three and four, that's what it's mm -hmm. yeah. happening mm -hmm. right now. Because I always say that not the AP teachers take the student's success, all teachers starting from eighth grade to senior year take the students to AP success. Mm -hmm. It's a building block. It's no way that the AP teacher can take the students to the success in one year. It's a collaboration throughout the years. Thank you. Thank you, anyone else have any questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you. So uh, later on in the board meeting, we'll be asking the board to vote on that course. All right, and for the last component of my report, I'm going to do an update regarding the high school and the Wheeler projects. I'm gonna scoot over to the podium one more time. So lots of outstanding things happening relative to our building projects. First off, I wanted to let the board know that the high school project, paving that is, is largely complete. On the next slide, you'll see the areas that were worked on over the summer, um, and that was largely a paving project, but along the way there were other things that had to be done like grading and refinements of the areas. So that is largely complete. I did ask Mr. Bustle earlier today to kind of highlight what are still on the punch list, so to speak. And there still needs to be some concrete pads installed for the bike racks on the north side of the building. We have to do some pipes installed so that the gates attach properly. Um, there are still some standing water issues that need to be fixed. Our speed bumps apparently have sharp edges. Those need to be smoothed out so they're not a hazard. And um, the drainage system needs to be cleared out. We need to clean some asphalt off the brick gym wall. And there needs to be some curbing uh, painting done for uh, safety purposes. We also have a little, we still are working on the electric system to make it more remote, which will be a big asset to our athletic department. Uh, right now, we have to send out give keys out to folks that lease our uh, athletic fields. We're working on a system that they are automated, so that should be in place once the ground thaws out in the spring. And we are also still working on the redesign of the audio system. We decided to wait until all these projects were done. We also anticipate that will be done in the spring. So I, I would call the punch list about 75% complete, which is to be expected about this stage of the game. Um, we also were able to get some signage as part of the project, so there's clear safety signs throughout the school that we identified again as our ongoing security efforts. So I, I, we're really pleased with how this turned out and we're nearly at the completion level for that project. Now on to the Wheeler project, which is making awesome uh, strides, but we're, we're about a fifth of the way through that project. So this is kind of an overview of what was worked on. On the next slide, 
shows you the uh, phasing components, and I'm going to let Mr. Batchelder jump in at any time here. So over uh, the first portion of this school year, they worked on phase one, which is where the cursor is kind of floating around. Um, phase one was recently reoccupied, and that was an extraordinarily exciting day at Wheeler, January 2nd, when the kids got to see their new classrooms for the first time. Before I launch into that, though, just so the board sh sees what's happening, on the opposite end of the building, uh, we did abatement over the Christmas vacation where any hazardous materials were removed, and now that section is under full-blown renovation. Um, you'd be amazed at how quickly, under the direction of Mr. Batchelder, the staff has moved swing space around. To save money, we did not do portable classrooms, so we're relying completely on swing space, um, other than having our preschool kids relocated to uh, Linden for two years. So we've had to cram classrooms into different nooks and crannies of the school, but the teachers and the kids have been troopers, and it's just amazing on how quickly they were able to make all of this happen, and there was tremendous organization on the part of Mr. Uh, Batchelder. And on this chart, I want to draw your attention to the fact that that blue uh, component on the back is the connector. That is absolutely the only new construction in this project that's connecting both wings together so that children can safely move from each end of the wing without going outside as they have to do now. Um, it also makes it much easier for kids on the further wing to get to the nurse's office. And as you know, the nurse at Wheeler is awesome, so they want to get there. Um, so these are, and that's really it. All the orange co color code represent, you know, minimal renovation and the green represents significant renovation, and the blue means an addition. So only one area is, is new. The rest is just renovation, either minimal or uh, significant. So that's all underway, and it's going beautifully. Um, on the next slide, we have some really neat before photos. So this is one of our students, and I hope I wrote her name down in my notes. Uh, let's see. I don't think I remember to do that, but Lynn knows. Rebecca Curtis. So Rebecca Curtis was going to write us an article about what happens when a school has a renovation project. So she went around with Matt Olaszewski. He's our project manager who's on site every day. Great guy, amazing to work with, um, always pleasant. So she's actually walking with him. She's got a little notepad and she's taking notes for her article. And Lynn Davis is our photographer. So in the first top photos, you see her looking kind of what a classroom looked like before, you know, in, in process of the renovation, both a hallway and a classroom. They looked pretty, pretty barren. You can even see the outside <laughs> uh, from one of those pictures. Right where she's standing in the left-hand corner, that's kind of, I believe, Matt pointing out where the connector's eventually going to go. He's kind of pointing across from that exit to across the way where the connector's going to go. And at the other picture, the far right-hand corner, lower right-hand corner, she's talking to Matt. But right now, that, I believe, is where the hardscape is now installed. And that was an idea that Mr. Batchelder had. He was worried that during um, these interim months, the kids would not be able to play outside if it were to be muddy and, you know, once we get through winter. So he worked with the architects to put a hardscape there. So that is now installed. Um, so the kids have a good place to play while the rest, you know, while the rest of the <clears throat> area is quite, quite messy. So it, that was a nice idea on his part to get, give those kids needed uh, recreational space outside. So these are our before photos. Now let's fast forward to the next slide. These are the after photos. So what you saw in the before photos was just this fall, and on January 2nd, this is a second grade classroom. Um, the kids were overwhelmed. Uh, I, Mr. Batchelder and I went in a couple of days ago and we asked them, well, so what's so good about this new school? What do you like about it? And here are some di direct quotes. I love our new desks and lockers. The lockers are really a big deal. That's a big, big deal. So you see them on the very back of that picture. Uh, having your own locker in the classroom is like huge if you're in grade two. Um, <laughs> The new monitor, you can see at the bottom there, that's our new monitor for the children for all the interactive uh, work that we do. And I've got to give a huge bang out to Kevin. His team was there every step of the way. Those monitors were installed by the end of that first week back. And there was issues on the end of the delivery where they didn't include the parts to attach it to the wall. 
So that threw a little wrench into things. But nevertheless, all of those monitors were installed by the end of last week. So everyone was able to hit the ground running. So the kids <coughs> think the new monitors are really cool. And um, because they're bigger and the picture is much more refined. Um, the kids also love their desks. Believe it or not, the desks have little ventilation holes all over the place. And at first I didn't understand that, but it, two reasons why. If for some reason you leave a sandwich in there for a period of time, you're going to be able to see in there so it doesn't get rotten. Um, but even more important than that is um, the light floods through there. So you can look in your desk and it's not dark. You can actually see what's in your desk. So I was curious as to why they had holes in them, but now I know why. Um, and the kids think their new classrooms are big and new. Um, so those are direct quotes from our second graders. But I, I do want to add that our parents have been so pleased with how the school has worked together, the, the students, the teachers, the staff are all, you know, really making this as smooth as possible for the kids. You, you would think, if you ever visited Wheeler, that maybe it'd be hard to instruct under those conditions, but the teachers are plugging away like, like troopers. And really, it's, it's, it's going along quite well. So on the next page, I just wanted to thank all the people that have been involved in this process. Uh, I tease Mr. Batchelder, but he's done this job with military precision. Um, everything's run like a top, the boxes were labeled, everything was just completely organized, and he's always on it. If, if there's something that didn't come in just right, like right now he's dealing with the heights of the desks, he's on it to make sure those desks are adjusted so our kids have good posture. Um, anything that's missing, additional countertops or cubbies, shelving, he's on it. Um, and the faculty and the staff have all just been really uh, taking all this in stride. We actually had members of the Plainville Rotary Club uh, visit Wheeler right before Christmas break to assist in making sure everything got moved over. So we had all hands on deck, um, including our own Shirley Osley and Stacy uh, Buden. We had PS, PCS administrators who either dedicated us, borrow their staff for that day, their subs, um, so that we could have extra hands on deck to allow the teachers that were moving into the new areas to reoccupy and have their classes covered. Mr. Guarino made the trip over to help out. Mr. LePage was moving furniture. Um, I didn't move furniture, but I was there anyway, just <laughs> saying hi and helping out. <laughs> it was a very rainy day. But, but really, we were all so determined to make sure that school was ready for January 2nd that all administrative staff uh, helped out by either giving us some of their staff or actually showing up that day. Facilities was there, 100%. Technology, as I already mentioned, Kevin. Uh, the Wheeler students just really were just so supportive. And our, our work with the um, architects has been really very good. Mark Sadensky, Matt Olszewski, and uh, the entire O&G and K&B staff. And our Capital Projects Building Committee. Um, I attend those meetings on a regular basis. And they're always ready to help us with change orders and um, very responsive team. We did do a tour with many of them did attend right before the holiday so that they could see the fruits of their uh, labor and time because that is a volunteer committee that meets every other week to discuss the, the building projects that we have underway. So, uh, and one last update that I got for the, from the architects today is they're going to go to the state very soon to get approval for our playground equipment. So that's another very, very important thing. So overall, the Wheeler project is going along beautifully. Um, you know, anything that was starting to fall behind schedule through Mr. Batchelor's efforts, we got it back on, on target. And did you need to add anything, Mr. B? All right. Even with all your germaphobe issues, you're still doing good over there? <laughs> Truly, truly a tremendous team effort. So that is the update I wanted to provide the board on the Wheeler project. I'm sure we'll do at least one more before the end of the school year. Did the board have any questions about that? Yeah, Dr. Perlman, I was just curious, once the uh, connector is completed, that space in the middle, what is that going to be developed into? Well, it's going to be like a hardscape. Um, it's going to be like an outdoor classroom environment. So we 
that's going to kind of come toward the end of the project, but it is going to be an area that teachers can utilize uh, to bring the classes outside when the weather's good. Um, so it's, right now it's sort of overgrown grass and some trees. It'll be mostly flattened out. Um, any thing you want to add there, Mr. Batchelder? Fantastic. It is right. Yeah, not, right now it's not as usable, but it will be much more usable after that part is completed. Thank you. All right. If there aren't any other questions, I just wanted to mention that we have officially received our CABE Board of Ed Board of Distinction Award for 2018. It lists all the years that the board has received this award since 2009. And we've got a little year to put on our plaque that we have going at central office. And special offer, we got a free CABE workshop as a little door prize. So if you see a CABE workshop you want to go to, talk to Joan. I've got the coupon. Are there any questions about that? We should be very proud of ourselves. We've won this award numerous years running. Lynn Davis helps us submit our application. And um, we've gotten a level of distinction by getting this award so many years in a row. And unless there is any questions, that does conclude my report for this evening. Thank you. Um, now we have our subcommittee reports. Um, our student representatives, Ali and Madeline. Uh, the final day of quarter two and semester one are approaching. The quarter will end this Wednesday the 16th and the semester will end next Wednesday the 23rd. And students have spent the first two weeks after break wrapping up their lessons and all their classes, getting ready for the midterms. And most teachers are handing out review packets, which are very helpful to everyone in the class. Exams start Thursday the 17th, and students will take their first four exams before the holiday weekend and resume exams Tuesday following Martin Luther King Day. There will be a field trip to the middle school on Wednesday the 30th with an assembly for the eighth graders that jazz band will also be performing for them. And on February 4th, the students will receive their report cards for the semester. And on February 5th and 7th, there will be tours for the incoming freshmen of the class of 2023. And this is great because it gives the eighth graders their first chance to really look around the building, get a feel for how their next four years are gonna go. And just a quick um, sports update. So our girls basketball team recently celebrated their qualification for the state tournament with a win over Tallinn High. Um, and they're looking to bring home another trophy for Plainville High this year. Uh, one of their captains was also named New Britain Herald's Athlete of the Week. So congrats to Caitlin Barker. Our hockey team is having a very exciting season with a record of six wins and two losses this far. And we look forward to seeing what they have in store for the rest of the season. The boys basketball team currently holds a record of five and five and looks to improve to six wins after a game tomorrow, home versus Manchester at 645. Our boys swim team is also having a good start to their season with a record of two wins and two losses with seven more meets in the season, so good chance to improve that record. Um, they have a meet tomorrow at home versus Rocky Hill at 4 p.m. And the wrestling team is having a strong season as well. Good season for everyone. Um, each wrestler looks to get stronger independently to improve the team standings overall. And indoor track will have their CCC competition on the 26th. Any questions for them? Thank you. Uh, next, we have the facilities report, Mrs. Tyrell. Um, the facilities subcommittee, I do think. Have we met I since our no, so. no, because that was right before our previous meeting. So we have not met since our um, last meeting. Okay. And the policy subcommittee? And there has been no the, meeting of the policy subcommittee. So. Uh, Mrs. Peterson, the finance subcommittee report? Uh, nothing to Nothing. Do. Okay. Um, Mrs. Tyrell, the advocacy? That's nothing. A, no, to nothing. Report. Okay. Turf committee? Dr. Uh, no, we have not Thank met. Um, okay. Mr. White. The PAC met on uh, January 9th. Uh, Part of the meeting was uh, a pretty significant review by uh, Mr. Johnson on uh, the really the high records in uh, winter athletics, the high participation, the highest it's ever been. Also, uh, just went over the uh, <coughs> midterm uh, examining schedule, which you just heard about. Uh, the uh, 
couple of dates for the for fundraising. Uh, Super Senior is going to be on May 23rd this year. Uh, May 16th will be the spring concert. And also Mr. PHS is going to be on March 21st. Uh, the group also discussed uh, having a premium uh, seating and VIP seating as well as premium and uh, VIP parking for this year's graduation as an additional fundraiser. And their current treasury now is $2,715.77. Uh, the next meeting was scheduled to be uh, in mid-March, but that is going to be to be announced because of the conflicts with that existing date. Okay. Thank you. Um, Tafalon, Mrs. Consalvo? Uh, the Tafalon PTO met Thursday, January 10th. Um, the PTO planned its next event, which is the Sweetheart Bingo. Um, it's an inexpensive fun evening for Tafalon families, and it's scheduled for February 8th. Uh, they also discussed upcoming <laughs> fundraisers, events, and uh, PTO sponsored assemblies. Um, at a previous PTO meeting, parents expressed in an interest in pursuing a more environmental approach to lunchtime waste and possible recycling. Uh, Michael Koch, the new food service director, will talk with the PTO at their next meeting about possible avenues to explore. And uh, the next meeting is scheduled for February 7th at 7 p.m. Okay, thank you. Um, Lyndon, Mrs. Wells? Yes, uh, the Lyndon PTO recently met on Wednesday, January 9th. They're currently focused on raising funds for a new Lindy mascot costume, which you would be quite surprised at how expensive it is. <laughs> um, they're currently planning for their Snowflake Sway, which is on February 18th. They are also currently trying to figure out a way to do more recycling in the school and teach the students more about recycling. I was kind of surprised to find out they have no recycling going on at Linden Street School, which makes me anxious, so I'm gonna see what I can do to help them out. And on January 31st, they're doing a fundraiser at Jane's Place. If you're not familiar with Jane's Place, it's a rev relatively new business here in town. And a percentage of the proceeds is gonna go to support Linden Street School. So I have uh, lots of information here about Jane's Place. I encourage you all to try it out. On January 31st, it's a really, really good, healthy place to eat in town. <coughs> okay, thank you. And the middle school, Mrs. St. Lawrence. Um, we met on Tuesday, January 8th. Um, let's see. We had a successful Five Below fundraiser. We also had a very successful Chipotle fundraiser. Um, we were a little nervous. You have to bring in $300 um, in sales, and luckily we made it to get 33% um, profit on that, so that was really a great, a great evening. Um, and we're looking forward to our carnation sale coming up in February. Um, I think that's it. Our next meeting will be, t um, I don't know, February 11th or something. I don't know. <laughs> second, second Tuesday of February. All right, thank you. Um, Wheeler Elementary, they canceled their December meeting and they are meeting this Wednesday. Uh, Mrs. Tyrell, do you have a correct council report? There was no correct council meeting um, since our last meeting. The next one is this Wednesday. Okay, thank you. And I will read Mrs. Hardy's chairperson's report. Uh, robotics interest is down in the high school, which may be due to the busy schedules they have. The good news is there is an increase in the middle school. Um, members of the Board of Ed will be attending a legislative breakfast January 24th at the state capitol. Many towns will be represented for, their, for this presentation on new laws or concerns. And the school budget season is upon us. Uh, technology and facilities are the improvements we, we are focusing on. Um, a joint meeting will take place at the Plainville Library Tuesday, January 15th, and everyone is welcome to come. All right. We have no unfinished business, so new business. Um, Board open forum. Anyone have anything to say? Really, Foster? Nothing. <laughs> I'll I'll just say that uh, I was able to attend the winter concert here at the high school. Um, awesome as always, and always impressed with how many kids we have participating. I think Mr. Johnson just mentioned 116 members in the band. It's like a fifth of the kids in the building. 
<laughs> so they did a great job. All right, anyone else? Okay. Um, Mr. Adelstein, you have a quarterly special education cost report for us? Yeah, thank you. So once a quarter, you asked me to report on special ed costs. It's important to look at it because it's very volatile and one of our highest cost um, areas. Mrs. Draczynski is here, our special education director, and she can help answer questions. What I can tell you is, as of right now, um, we have 40 outplay students, and we are $142,000 behind budget. So what that means is if all those outplay students <laughs> remained outplaced to the end of the year, if we didn't have any additional outplay students between now and the end of the year, if our excess cost grant reimbursement came in exactly what we expect, we would be $142,000 behind at the end of the year. However, it's January. That's not going to happen. Um, Mrs. Straczynski knows that she's even bringing special education, four special education students back into district as we speak. Um, and uh, it's, it's <clears throat> early to forecast the end of the year for special education. So no action to take. It's really FYI at this point. And um, you'll hear next from us in March when we'll have more information. I just have a question, and we don't anticipate any cuts from what we expect in the reimbursement as of right now? It's so um, we will get our first reimbursement in February based on, on what was submitted in December. Um, we're very close to what we had. We're, and if the reimbursement rate holds to what we were reimbursed right. last year, we'd be very close to what we expect. Okay, that's what I was wondering, the rate. few okay. there, too. Okay. Can, and can I request a, a favor? When you put the enrollment and the number of placements, mm -hmm. can you kind of put the previous report's number? Sure. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. we could see the difference? Yeah. That's and so right now, the number that you see in front of you is 40, and on the previous report, I believe it was 30... It's up a couple. I have it on my computer. Yeah. So, right, we're calling these outplay students, but this is not a special education. So those 11 students there, right. Because if somebody hears that and says, wow, 40, that sounds high, you know, it's not really 40 for that purpose. But The, the number we reported last month was 37, so it's up three. And we can put the comparative column next time. So the uh, students that do come back from outplay, they come in from Magnus schools? Is that what it is? No. So that they are coming from um, Special education, um, clinical day schools. What's bringing what's bringing them back here? Um, in most, in a couple of cases, there were students who were outplaced when they lived in a different district. Their families had moved to town, and so we have appropriate programs, and okay. so we have built relationships with those families, and we're ready to bring them into a district-wide program. Uh, that's the case for two families. Um, in a, in two other situations, um, there are students who were. Um, outplaced for specific issues, mm -hmm. and they're now re resolving those issues and are ready to come back to the district. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, and can I get a motion for item C? Oh, request to approve um, a new course proposal, AP French at the um, high school. Second the motion. Okay, I have a first and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Any against? Any abstentions? All right. And can I get a motion for item D? Motion to request approval of appointment of the new assistant principal of Plainville High School. Second. Okay, I have a first and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Um, 
Yay! Congratulations. And her name is Jen DiLorenzo. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, we have the consent agenda. Does anyone have any issues they want to take anything out of it and discuss? No? Motion okay. to approve the consent agenda as uh, listed. Seconded. Okay, I have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Any abstentions? Okay. And can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion, motion to adjourn. Second. She seconded. All right. All in favor? Aye. Anyone want to stay? No? <laughs> Any abstentions? All right. Thank you.